Tonight's guest is Alan. Alan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Vic. Well, thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate your time. Alan, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, uh, I'm in my early 20s, and uh, I was born and raised in mid-Michigan, the Lower Peninsula. And uh, I grew up hunting, fishing, farming, and uh, I've been doing that since I could walk pretty much. And uh, now I've got my own thing going on, but I still come back and hunt. And yeah. Sounds like you have a good life, but sure is a shame you've got dogmen complicating things. Yeah, they have made things a little bit difficult, but just living life the best I can right now. Well, that's all you can do. Can't do any more than that. Let's set a baseline, Alan. What were your thoughts on the existence of dogmen before you had your first encounter? Well, I never really thought that, at least for my area specifically, that something like this may not be around because of the way things are set up around here. You know, we're lots of agriculture lots of uh, woods and a lot of people would think yes that's pretty good for you know something like that but also it had a lot of predatory action a lot of coyotes not a healthy deer population not a healthy small game population so i didn't really think that an area like this would be able to support something like this so to me it was like oh it's out of sight out of mind that's pretty much how it was for me Yeah, if only out of sight, out of mind worked. Yes. Where did your two encounters happen, if you don't mind revealing that? So, where I grew up was pretty much my grandfather's property. Back then it was a small town. Now it's grown up to be uh, very populated and we get a lot more traffic than usual. And, uh, well, he had some land that he purchased back when my dad was six years old and he ended up starting off with a small amount and uh, worked his way up and became friends with the farmer and uh, was able to purchase quite a decent amount of land, which ended up being 70 acres. And when I came along, my dad didn't have his own place yet. So I was born into my grandfather's house. And two years later, my dad built his house only a couple hundred yards from my grandfather's house. And I pretty much lived my whole life on this property. And uh, it's all I'll ever know. Sounds like a great place to grow up to me. It truly is. Yeah, it sure sounds like it. You contacted me a few years ago to let me know about the first encounter you had. Actually, you were 14 when you had it. How had things been going for you after we spoke back then? That is, until you had this most recent encounter. Things were actually going pretty good. I noticed that our deer herd, our population, at least in are what I consider five to 10 mile radius because a lot of people don't understand that white tailed deer don't have a very large range. You know, they only go within one or two miles. And I noticed the population of them went up, but along with that, more coyotes and they have become more brave or either more ignorant for some young ones where they'll come out broad daylight. And I've had them come up to me, follow me, which I thought it was very strange, but eventually it became normal and, uh, things have been very good, very peaceful and, uh, all around relaxed and, uh, yeah. Yeah. That is strange. Them approaching you like that. Coyotes don't do that normally. If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content, that's an option. To find out how, please go to dogmanencounters.com forward slash podcast. There's something about this most recent encounter you had that's just so traumatic, in my opinion. Has it removed any interest you have in going back into the woods? I would say probably like a very small percent because when I go out early in the morning, I find myself going out a little bit later, hesitating until the last minute where it's just starting to get daylight. I usually like to go out when it's pitch black before any light, any birds. So that way I can give time for everything to settle and all the pressure 
that whatever pressure there was there, maybe I kicked up a deer or, you know, maybe I'd rustled some brush or left the scent and let everything, you know, kind of calm down. And that way it makes it seem like I'm not in the area. So that way I get the proper jump on them element of surprise. And, uh, I find myself going out a little later and later and sometimes even I'll come in a little earlier than usual and I would sit out till dark too. It's affected me in a way where I, I, I become very fairly anxious when I come out here, but you know, I try not to let it stop me from doing what I like to do. But essentially when I get out to my spot and I'm either way up in the tree or up in an elevated blind or on a nice insulated ground blind, I can relax and enjoy it instead of wondering, oh, what's that noise? What's that noise? I'm able to unwind a little bit. I'll tell you what, after having the encounter you had this most recent time, for you to be able to even set foot in the woods the way you are, you don't frighten easily. Well, I'm very (laughs) hard-headed and stubborn. (laughs) So I have just as much the right to be out here as that dogman is out here and this is pretty much all I've ever known and I don't want to lose it. It's my, I really enjoy being out here. It's my getaway. It's my, like my little vacation, daily vacation type dealio. I don't want to get rid of that. It goes without saying, I'm so glad to hear that you can do that. That's great. And of course, the listeners, after they hear you talk about what happened to you, they're going to understand why I say that. If you've had a Dogman encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest on one of my two Bigfoot shows, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let me know. Let's get into it now, Alan. Please tell us about your encounters now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. All right. My first encounter happened when I was 14 years old and it was late December is what I remember. And it was during winter break and I decided I wanted to come out for the last couple of weeks of deer season. And I already had harvested two bucks and I had three tags. I was able to get a third antlerless tag. So I wanted to, I wanted to get a chance to maybe put some more meat in my freezer and, uh, help my grandfather because we do use a lot of venison. We'd rather use venison than, you know, going to the store and getting some beef to me it has better flavor and it's all natural. And, uh, I find it more ethical in a way. And yes, we were farmers once upon a time, but to me, harvesting something that has lived a fulfilled, free life, being able to do what it was meant to do puts me more at ease than going to the store and buying a pound of, you know, your ground beef or, and I do enjoy a good prime rib or a good New York strip steak. I don't discriminate when it comes to that, (laughs) but at the end of the day, I prefer wild game over typical stuff you'd purchase at a grocery store. So I decided to go out that Saturday morning. I remember waking up at four 30 and I, I just felt really off when I woke up. I felt anxious, you know, and I was thinking to myself, do I want to go out or do it? Should I just sleep in and I'll go out this evening and I'll go out tomorrow morning, you know, get some more rest. And, uh, five o'clock rolls around and I finally decide to, you know, I'm going to go out and I'll have a better chance. The more I'm out there, if I'm actually out there, I get up and uh, I get ready. I'm feeling anxious this whole time. Like I'm on the verge of, and I'm, I'm, I'm a high strung person. I will admit, but I haven't felt that kind of pressure. And I remember not feeling that kind of pressure or anxiety like that since I was probably eight years old. I wasn't much of a morning person then. And I kind of trained myself to be more of a morning person. And, uh, I remember getting up, I get ready and I go to walk out the door and I, before I walk out the door, I checked how the weather's going to be, what the wind's going to be. So that way I have an idea of how things may play out and uh, where I should start 
a day off with of where I should sit, what spot should I choose, what would be the best spot. And our property is fairly large. It's half mile deep by a quarter mile wide. So that's fairly decent sized property. It takes about 15, 20 minutes to get to the spot I want on foot. So I step up the door and I remember it just being ice cold out. It was, I think, 23 degrees out that morning and it was frost on the ground. There was no snow, which was quite surprising for being late December, but there was no snow on the ground. The ground was very crunchy and hard and it was frozen from it being so cold. We end up having a really rainy November in early December instead of snow, I remember. And so I set off. I go walk behind our barn. I notice it's dead quiet. There's no noise, no wind. And it was, uh, I remember it being a crescent moon, so I had a fairly well-lit path. I didn't have to use a flashlight, so I, I didn't go out with a flashlight. And a lot of the time before this last encounter, and I'll probably get back over it and go back to not using a flashlight again, but I like to not use a flashlight, so it, it alerts less in my area. And, you know, sometimes you walk past bedded deer and don't know it. Minimal disturbance is pretty much what I'm trying to get at, is I like to create the minimum amount of disturbance in the area so that way I have the best hunt possible. And I walk up behind the bar noticing that it's quiet. I got a fairly amount of light even though it's dark out. And I get about 150 yards away from our barn, from the back of the barn, and it drops down into this little swamp. And I I have to cross this little bridge to cross a creek. We have rolling hills in our area, so it's not perfectly flat, but it's also abundance of woods and ag fields. So we have nice openings and nice choke points. And this spot happens to be a big choke point. And I have some game cameras set up there. And I remember walking down through there. And I remember I pulled them all the evening before I went out pulled all my cameras so I could check the batteries and check all the cards. So I didn't have any cameras out at this time. And once I get to that bridge, I remember getting this sensation of dread. Like there's danger. If I keep going back here, if I keep going, there's danger. So I get up, step up onto the bridge and I start having like a cold sweat, you know, getting nervous, getting anxious. And I'm looking around. At this point, I have my my firearm in my hands, which was a 20-gauge H&R. So what it is, is it's a rifled shotgun designed to shoot slugs and slugs only. I'm holding it in both my hands at this point because I felt anxious and nervous. So I wanted to, you know, it was that sense of security. I had it right there in my arms, ready to go, ready for action. And I look around, I pause. I listen and it's still dead quiet. All I can hear is my breath and my footsteps. And I decide to continue on. I'm going to go to the very back of this property. I'm going to see all these kinds of deer. You know, I'm just thinking about how my hunt's going to play out and how it's going to go. So I continue on and I just felt like I was being watched at that point. Something was watching me. And for a second, I thought I heard footsteps behind me. And I paused. I take a few steps. I pause, listen, take a few steps, pause, and listen. And I'm trying to, I'm wearing a soft bottom hunting boot. It's a soft sole. So that way it's more forgiving on uh, noisy terrain. And I get out to the first opening after coming up out of that lowland and that crossing that bridge. And I stop and I take a look and I'm just listening, trying to see as far as the best I can, even though it's minimum moonlight, it's crescent moon. I take a pauser, gather my surroundings, and then I continue on. And I get to my blind. We lock our blinds because we have a lot of people, uh, land surrounding our land. And we've had people come onto our land unknowingly before. So we lock our blinds. And I remember I'm sitting at the bottom of the steps and I'm looking for the key. So that way I'm not doing it up there on the frozen steps just in case something happens. And I throw my slug gun over my shoulder and I 
slowly walk up the steps, have the key in my hand. I go to put it in the lock. Like, so, you know, I hear coyotes going nuts, just going absolutely crazy. And it sounds like it's only probably about 150 to 200 yards away. I, I'm sitting over this ag field with a hill in the middle of it. And right on the other side of it is woods. It's about 100 acres of woods, just all woods. So I'm thinking, well, maybe I'll see a coyote and this will become a coyote hunt. Put the key in, twist it. They're going nuts. And I'm thinking, wow, that's insane. They're right, like right there. Maybe I'm going to see one. And I step in the blind close the door, lay my gun in the corner, the closest corner to me. And we have a nice chair in there. And I sit down and I open the window and I'm still hearing them go off for a second. And then I hear a really deep sounding howl, almost like a wolf, but it turns into kind of a scream at the end. And it goes on for about a few seconds and then it stops and it's dead silent from there on. And it sounded almost right on top of those coyotes, maybe not a little bit further back in. So I'm thinking, whoa, what was that? Maybe that was the big coyote. Maybe that was, and it'd be very, very rare to see a wolf in the lower Eastern part of Michigan in mid Michigan. Usually you see something like that way up, maybe towards Alpena, Sheboygan area, or most likely up in the upper peninsula. But that would be very, very rare to see something like that down here and I thought that was quite strange so I sit there and listen at this point I could see just a little bit of light poking from the tree coming from the skyline but it's overcast but you can start seeing it start getting light up I think it was around 550 ish this is when I'm fully settled in this blind it's starting to get six and I just see a tad bit of light so I get these big binoculars out and what I learned from a young age is that it kind of works like it's like an extension to your pupil. You know how your pupils dilate at nighttime to allow more light in for you to see better. Well, having a large set of binoculars allows more light in one end for you to be able to almost see pretty well in low light conditions. And I've also learned that to be true with rifle scopes too. Therefore, I use fairly large high powered scopes on high, well, what's legal to use around here in order for me to coyote hunt makes it better experience and the special spotlight I use for them also makes it easier to see them through a scope. It's a tinted light. So it's like a amberish red color right around then when it's starting to get light, I like to take about a 15 minute nap or so, a 20 minute nap just to kind of refresh myself for a second because it's not legal shooting hours. It's, hardly bright enough to shoot yet so it starts getting lighter so my targets are more identifiable and that way lord forbid make either inhumane or misidentify my target for something i don't want to shoot so i'm out sitting and uh I, i couldn't even get relaxed enough to be able to nod off i was just too anxious i felt really nervous the whole time my heart was kind of pounding my chest a little bit here and there kind of my blood was running a little bit cold you know i was just real nervous and disturbed for it and felt like i was being watched it goes on like that for another hour or so and uh, it's starting to get light and usually i see deer as it's just starting to get light all the way up until broad daylight they'll stick around for a minute you know eat off our food plots eat off the ag fields and they'll hang out for about 30 minutes to an hour or so, and then move on, continue to where their, their destination is or wherever they plan on going. And uh, and then the next few come through and they just kind of keep filtering through until 11 o'clock usually, or sometimes you'll get lucky and see that big buck midday, but it's around seven ish and it's well bright enough to see, to make a clear shot. It's, it's a little hazy out in the distance. It's overcast. So it's a little dark still. And I remember I'm looking out the window that's facing north over this ag field and I catch something. I'm looking through the binoculars, looking at the very back of the fields, about 250 yards away with these big binoculars. And I set them down for a second to let my eyes adjust. And so I'm not straining my eyes and I go to put it back up and I catch something out of the corner of my eye 
So I put him back down and look, and here I see this, what I thought for a second was a fairly large wolf or coyote. But then I look at, I'm, I'm sitting there looking at it. I'm like, wait, no way that it's a coyote because it, it's, it's all black. It's like all black. And all I see, and I put my binoculars back up to get a better look at it. All I see is bright yellow, well, not bright yellow eyes, but that they kind of remind me of a black cat's eyes, but they don't have the, the same pupil as them. They have dog eyes. And it's sitting there at the very edge. Oh, I'd say it's probably about 150 yards away of the edge, other edge of this field to my right. And I'm sitting there staring at it. And it's sitting there looking over the field. Gets up for a second, you know, sniffs the ground. I'm thinking, what is this thing? No way this is somebody's dog. It was way too big to be somebody's dog. It kind of had a little bit of a hunchback, too. Like, it's when it got up and walked a little bit, that its back legs were tad stubbier tad shorter than its front legs so i thought what kind of dog is this and it it had uh, a tail on it you know it looked like a wolf's tail to me it had the same shape same consistency and fur looking through the scope and at this point it being overcast uh, i get a little break in the clouds and sun's starting to come through so i get a a little bit of a sunspot through the field for you know, every few seconds. And I remember the rest of the day after that being completely overcast, but you know, I get a nice break for probably about 20 minutes of sunlight. And I'm, I'm sitting there staring at this thing for a good five minutes, trying to to figure out whether or not I should either, is it a coyote and I should shoot it? You know, I don't want to shoot somebody's dog by mistake. And is this a wolf? And if I mistake it for a coyote and shoot it, am I going to get in trouble? So a lot of thoughts are going through my mind right now. So I, I guess I come to conclusion. I look, I'm looking at it and I'm like, this thing looks too wild. It looks more like a wild animal than somebody's pet. So I decide I'm going to shoot this thing, get rid of it. So I, I didn't have a great enough angle out of that north window. So I go to the east window which was the window facing it. And I slide it open as quiet as possible, just inch it open. And I get my gun up. I turn it up to five power and I put it right on its, right on its shoulder. And I take a deep breath. I, I'll let it out slowly, I slowly cock the be- hammer back. And it's, it's an H and R. So it, ha- it has no safety. It's just a basic, single shot brake barrel slug gun and it has a hammer on it that you got to manually cock so I pull back the hammer and the second it goes click this thing I'm looking at it through the scope right in its chest turns its head right towards me and is staring what seemed to me like right into my eyes from 150 yards away and I'm looking at it through a high powered scope And I noticed this, so I'm looking at it through the scope now at its face, and it has its ears cocked towards me. They look like, you know, wolf ears. It looked like, like I said, an overly large, like a large, large, bigger than, because I've seen wolf, wolves before. I've been up to the UP. I've had, I have family member that own like 80 acres up in the UP. And I remember being out there when I was, when, um, I think, was it my third year? After I started hunting, my third year hunting, we went up there for deer, and uh, I remember having a small pack of coyotes, about three of them, run three or four of them, run right by our blind, about 100 yards, just walking through. And this looks way bigger than those wolves I've seen. And I, I notice it's, it's staring at me. I'm staring at it. And next thing you know, it opens its mouth and it has really big teeth, like bigger teeth. than I think the biggest dog I've ever seen in person was an Alaskan Malamute, or I think it was an Irish wolfhound. And I thought their teeth were big. I thought they were big dogs. No, this thing was big, had big teeth. And it was almost like it was smiling at me 
didn't have its lip curled back. Um, I'm starting to freak out at the panic at this point. I'm like, should I shoot it now? Should I shoot it now? And I finally calm myself. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to shoot it right between the eyes. And as I do that, it stands up in leaps from its spot forward. And I think it leaps like it, it leaps quite a lar- long way. I wouldn't say 50 feet, but it leaps probably a good 40 feet or so or less. You know, maybe I, I'm overthinking this and over exaggerating a little bit, but it, it I've never seen a dog stand up on its back legs and leap like that ever in my life. You know, I've seen wolves and stuff and coyotes stand up on their hind legs to get a better look at their surroundings. But they usually, they run up, stand up on their hind legs. Even foxes do it. Get a good look at their surroundings, figure out or look for prey, and they back down on all fours and scurrying away. No, it leaped from exactly where it was standing, a good 30 to 40 feet, and then it leaped again, and then it leaped again until it was out in front of my north-facing window. And then it completely clears the other half of the field in two leaps. And mind you, that's a hundred yards across from that, from the middle of where it was to this other tree line. And it leaps all the way across. And all I hear it was hitting the branches and that was it. And my blood ran completely cold. My heart was like in my throat. Like I could, all I could hear was my heart pounding. And I just remember shaking like buck fever times 10, like just shaking and being ice cold and sweating. Like, like, a like it was like a, a faucet, like somebody turned on a faucet. Like I was just sitting there pouring sweat and I didn't even have the heater on yet. I wasn't cold and I was still wearing all my hunting gear and I wasn't even cold enough yet to put the heater on. And I have uh, a hoodie, like, uh, I had three layers on, but the first two layers were thin. So I had uh, my long johns on, shirt and pants. And then I had jeans over that and a t-shirt. And then I had um, this big Carhartt hoodie, this big dark green Carhartt hoodie. And then I had my camouflage jacket over that because I wanted, I wanted a hoodie so I can put up over my head if I decide to sit in the blind, you know, be prepared for the weather and keep keep the cold off the back of my neck and keep my ears warm. And I'm just sitting there drenched in sweat, scared as I've more than I've ever been in my life. And I closed all the windows and I put the gun across my lap and I just sat there. I sat there. I sat there until 12 o'clock noon. And it like I was I was freaked out. I sat there until twelve o'clock noon, and a lot of people, yeah, they sit out there. My grandfather didn't come out with me, so I'll usually sit out until ten thirty, eleven ish, because that's when he makes breakfast. I sat out there till twelve o'clock noon, and then even when I went to go leave, I was so scared. I'm like, hey, can you come out here? I, I called my grandfather up. Hey, can you come out here and pick me up? Because I was terrified. And I wanted to get out there and I just made some, some excuse as to why to have him come get me. And I don't remember what, what I told him. Um, I just remember being uh, how scared I was. And when he seen me, he's like, Oh, what happened? You look as pale as a ghost. Did something scary. And I'm like, no, no, I'm, I'm fine. I'm just not feeling well, you know? And told him, I I lied to him and told him I had a little cold or something. And I just remember after getting back to the house, I put my gun away, wiped everything off. I went straight into the bathroom and I sat in there because I felt sick. I was sick for a good 30 minutes. The how up, how unsettling this was to me at the time. And, you know, now that I've gotten older, I've, learn to control that a little bit and call myself a lot more, but it was 
very traumatic to me at that time because I didn't really think I would ever in my lifetime see something like this unless I went out of the state for whatever reason or went all the way up to the UP or went up went up into an area where there's been sightings. And even then, I was doubting I'd be able to see them. It probably, to me, it was like, oh, it's the right circumstances. Well, to me, I was thinking, wow, I guess we do have the right circumstances in order to for something like this to occur. And for, uh, I think, what was it, the last two weeks of deer season, I didn't go out for a lot, the rest of that week. I ended up going out the last three days, but that's only because my grandfather was out here and he was only sitting about 200 yards behind me. And even then I still felt unsafe having another person out here with me. And it was really unsettling. And then, uh, I think a a few months later, I ended up finding out about Vic's dog man channel. And I contacted him after hearing a few stories and I related to him. And I remember feeling being able to calm myself down and feel a little bit better about it. And uh, a few years go on, I completely forget about it. And like I said, I'm in my early twenties now and I'm having my own house redone. And my girlfriend and I are unable to be there at the moment because we have the floors ripped up and everything's tore up. So we're staying at my grandfather's. We've been here for I think three, almost a month now. And so I've, I found myself having more and more time to c- go out after work. I get off work at like six, six thirty, and I come home, get a shower and I'd be like, Oh, well, it's still daylight out and it's just evening time. I, I, I think I'll, I'll go out coyote hunting. And I don't usually don't, I've never had calls really work for me. Any form of call They usually every time I've used a call, even after hearing them, it just ended up being a completely silent night. And I don't know if that's coincidental or not with the dog man sighting or have anything to do with that, but who knows? But, you know, it's, it's years later now. And, uh, I think what was it three weeks ago now it was still, I think the weather was still in the seventies, 60 ish area, but I, I've been coyote hunting all summer at this point and going out every every other weekend or every Saturday that I can and just keeping it at that. But lately I've been finding like after having to stay with him for a little bit, I've had more time to go out. So I decided within the second week of, or yeah, no, it's been three weeks. So within the, so it's been four weeks we've been here within the second week of being here. So we've been here for a month now, almost a little over and, I decided I, I have the time, so why not go out and look for more coyotes? You know, every chance I get, deer season's coming upon us. It's uh, only a few weeks away, and I decided I wanted to go out and get rid of some predators, you know. So I go out to the back. I use a climbing tree stand, and I have some fairly straight trees around here, but, you know, I, I have to clean off some branches, get rid of some branches, so that way I can get up a little bit higher. But the highest I can go is 10 feet before I'm enclosed by the tree line and I'm not able to see further than 50 yards in front of me because there's so much trees and limbs and whatnot that with all the foliage and stuff, even if the leaves weren't on the trees, I still wouldn't have a clean enough shot. So I set 10 and a half to 11 feet off the ground with a climbing stand not all ladder stand and uh it works pretty well i've had coyotes walk right under it. i've had deer walk right under it multiple times during muzzleloader season during archery season and i've made quite a few kills only 15 yards from sitting in a climbing tree stand so i go out back and i pick out the spot over this low area of a field now it's kind of part swamp and then the rest is agricultural field and i think at the time they had only soybean stubble. So the ground was fairly bare, especially down in this low area. So I decided there was a nice open enough area. It's actually like a little corridor for coyotes. They, they walk across the south end of this field, and then they come up this lane along this hay field along the edge of the woods, and then they cut straight across the about 400 yards across this open regular 
field that they till up and plant corn, wheat, soybean, or whatever. And they typically walk straight down the middle of it, up over this hump of a hill. And most of the time, once they get halfway through, they turn west and start walking towards the corner of my property and the corner of that field. Mind you, I have permission to shoot over onto that field because that is also the neighbor that gave me permission. So I'll usually get them right at that creek that's right at the back of this field. And so we have a a lane that goes across the very back of our property and goes straight through the center of our neighbor's property that has the big steel telephone poles for, I think, Edison. We call that the Edison easement. That goes along the back of this field, the north end of this field. So does a creek. They'll usually stop for a few seconds on the edge of this creek, look around, look across it, get up over the other side, and there's still enough open space for me to make a clear shot on the other side. And they'll stop, look around, and then continue on their way. So I'll either usually wait for them to stop naturally, or if I have one of my higher powered rifles, like a 450 Bushmaster, and a lot of people may think, well, why would you use something like that? Why won't you just use a shotgun or a 22 or a 223 now that it's legal? Well, every time I've used, and you, people can call me a bad shot all they want. I don't know if it's just my luck, but even when it comes to archery hunting, even if I make the best, the best shot, for some reason, I've lost animals. I've, and it's only happened twice. Once with a coyote, I shot with a two, two, three, right on the shoulder. And it managed, I tracked it all the way through my neighbor's property and it was fresh, bright colored blood and it didn't stink. So I was very confused. So from now on, I use a 450 Bushmaster or my 20 gauge slug gun and I put it right on the shoulder and it stops them dead in their tracks. And the story does it with deer. So I decided to use that and it's what's legal and it's what works perfect so this next encounter we've been staying here for a while and uh i remember wanting to go out for coyotes so mind you it's it's still fairly warm out i think it was it was only four weeks ago and it was still 70 60 degrees out and uh i get up at 5 30 and I get ready and uh, it's 20 minutes till six o'clock when I decided to walk out the door and I noticed I didn't hear a single sound. The sun's starting to peek over the trees a little bit. So that was a little bit of an incentive to kick it into gear and try to get out here faster. But I noticed on my way out, I didn't hear a single sound, not a bird, not a chirp, nothing, not even bugs or anything. And I start getting this uneasy feeling again. I'm like, this feels familiar, but I'm not thinking about my very first encounter with dogmen. That had completely passed over me, and I wasn't even thinking about it. And I'm like, this feels really odd. This is really strange. So I take the same path I did all the way out to this back corner where out in this back corner, I'd pick the tree, hung my climbing stand up in it, and it's about 200 yards from the spot I was sitting from my first encounter. And I'm overlooking this low land on the back of an ag field. It has an easement for Edison going through it from east to west on the north end of this field. And I'm sitting 50 yards under this lane, but I'm overlooking the lane from where I'm sitting in this tree. And there's a creek right at the back of that field and i like to sit down in this spot during the winter and uh this year they didn't plant anything down in this low area it was too wet so we got short grass down in there right now but they decided to plant corn so i decided to set up over this spot because the coyote use it as like a little corridor and they stop right before they cross the creek or either i stop them before they even get to the creek because i have a nice open shot in this low spot it's about 200 yards deep and uh, 150 wide. And I have a nice 
open shot is probably 120 yards at the most where everything comes through and filters in and then crosses this creek and then up into our neighbor's woods. And the coyotes usually stop before the creek. Well, this lane that comes on the north side of this creek that comes down, it starts off in a very steep hill and then it comes down into this low area. Well, I caught something when I walked out here after it being completely silent. I felt uneasy when I was climbing the tree and I just felt really nervous the whole time. I'm like, why, why is I felt like this before here? Why it was just very familiar and I became very nervous and, and I'm sitting out, I, I, I've been sitting at this point, I've been sitting in the tree for about 30 minutes and it's been dead silent. It's starting to get light enough for me to shoot. And I haven't seen a single thing. I haven't seen a deer. I haven't seen a sandhill crane. I haven't heard the little birds chirping, squirrel, rabbits. I haven't even seen a thing. And I catch a little commotion off the top of this hill. Right next to this one, this first power pole before it enters onto my neighbor's property. I can see about 600 yards up to this hill and almost to his property line. But I see a little commotion up into the brown, up in the brown, to, little, the grass is a little bit tall up there. You know, people can't really get up there to trim or, or anything. So I catch a little movement. Now I have this rest that flips down. It, it ratchet straps to the tree. It's a flip up rest. Some people may know what I'm talking about, but I have this rest. I get my gun. I had my gun between my legs. I usually hang it up on a hook, but I had it between my legs leaned up against this rest because, and I use this rest because the crossbar on my tree stand isn't high enough for me to use as a rest. I like, I like to take the most stable shot possible. So I dispatch animals as humanely as possible, but I get my gun up on the rest I don't have my binoculars, so I, I use my scope. I have the bolt open just in case. You know, I don't want to misidentify this as a deer, a person, somebody's pet. You know, I want to make sure it's what I'm after. And I, I think it's a two and a half by nine weaver scope is on this gun. And I have a range dial on the left side for focus so I can focus up to so far so I, mind you they're probably what 300 yards from where i'm sitting at this point coming down this lane i noticed movement i look through the scope focus my scope in on it go up to the highest magnification and i noticed it looks like two coyotes coming down and like exact like exactly like coyotes it looked like two coyotes but to me they were off they were fairly big and I've seen coyotes come down this trail many a times. And I've sat out here, like I said, all summer, pretty much at this point. So I've had them come from all over and I, a lot of people ask, well, I don't, I hunt them at night or hunt them in the evening. I've had the best luck hunting them for my area in the morning. And over this spot specifically, it's just they cross through my property, they cross through the neighbor's property in this spot. So this is where I chose to sit. I've seen multiple coyotes come down this trail many a times before. I see these two particular ones. Now they look like normal coyotes that are just uh, in summer coat and, uh, you know, brownish tan or blonde almost with a hint of gray because it's starting to, it's starting, everything's starting to cool off and it's, you know, it's getting to be that time of year and uh, they're coming down the trail. And I noticed they were bigger than usual. And coyotes aren't typically very big. I think the biggest coyote I've ever shot, and I weighed it with guts in because I used to skin them. But now I give them to, you know, friends that want to hide because, you know, I let them do it the way they want to do it. So I don't mess it up. I'm not particularly good at skinning small game. <laughs> I'm better with large like deer and bigger stuff. And I usually just give them away. But to me, they were off. But the biggest coyote I've ever seen was 
75 pounds. That's big for a coyote. So a lot of people may think, oh, that, are you sure are you over exaggerating? Yes, I understand. That's fairly big for a coyote. Back on track. I see these two fairly large coyotes coming down the trail. I'm like, oh, there's two of them. So mind you, I forgot one thing to mention is I didn't just carry out one gun that morning. I carried out two firearms. I carried out an AR and I carried out my Mossberg Patriot. Both my AR and my Mossberg happened to be chambered in 450. And, you know, people may think I'm crazy. Yeah, I like it. I like that round a lot. It works fairly well for me. But I have this custom made 450 hanging off my back. I climb up into the stand with it on my back. I pull the other one up by rope. I have this AR hanging off the stand tucked right next to my right leg so the muzzle's only an inch from the bottom platform i get my patriot up on the rest i'm noticing they're fairly large they're coming down the trail i'm thinking to myself i'm gonna let them get to 120 yards i'm gonna stop them and i'm gonna try to dummy one of them and hopefully if i'm lucky the other one doesn't jump into the woods and take off and this one will either keep running towards me or run south into this field, and I'll get a shot off at that one. So I'm trying to decide which one I'm going to shoot. I have markers that tell me, and I, basically just landscape or trees or bushes or tufts of grass that tell me that I have previously lasered with my rangefinder, and I use them as markers to determine my ranges and how far they are. So at this point, they're 150 out, so I just waiting for them to get up to this pine tree that's on the edge of this trail. And that's, that's 120 for me. That's 120. They're coming west, right towards me. All I need them to do is get right before that tree, and I'll stop them, and they'll probably stop a little bit after that, and I'll dummy one of them at least. So they're coming. I make sure there's a round in the gun. They get to that spot. I, I yelp at them. Give them a, you know, a little hoot. They both stop. Look my direction. I click my safety off. And as I did that, I felt as if I felt a little, you know, a little. I felt something on the side of my uh, outer side of my leg, like on my ankle, because I was wearing blue jeans and tennis shoes. Mind you, it's. 60 degrees out this morning like in in the morning at that time or 70 degrees so i was just in a camouflage t-shirt blue jeans and some comfortable tennis shoes and i had soaked myself with scent killer so that way i don't you know leave my scent as i'm walking through and i felt a little bit of a, a puff go up my up my pant leg on my ankle and I hear a sniff noise. And I have my I'm looking out at these two coyotes and then I freak out for a second and I'm like, what's that? And I start looking over my shoulder down to the right of me, and I have to look over this rest because it's like shoulder height for me. And I'm look peeking over this rest, and all I can see is top of a head two ears they look like coyote ears to me and i can see it's i can see it's back and it looks like coyote fur i'm sitting there looking at it and my blood runs cold for a second because i'm thinking what, what is that i didn't i didn't get a good enough look at it right at that second to know what it was immediately and then it clicks those are dog ears what the I set my forfeit my my patriot down. I grab my AR and sight on safety off, and I point it straight down. And as I'm doing this, this thing is slowly getting down. After sniffing my leg, both arms up on the tree, and now I don't remember getting a good enough look at its 
hands or paws or whatever. I kind of did for a second. To me, it looked like paws, but with really long fingers and nails. And I remember it it wasn't super bulky or overly muscular, but it was big. It had, it was well built. And I'm looking down at it through my red dot and I, I'm pointing it right at it and I'm sitting there and it's staring at me and I'm staring at it. And it looks exactly the same as these two odd looking coyotes out in this field. And I'm thinking, holy crap, this thing is huge. And it has yellow looking eyes, but the confusing part to me is they're not black. Neither of the three, what I thought was coyotes were now that I know that they're, or if they are dogmen or some variant of dogmen, they were not black like dogmen. They look like coyotes, very, very large coyotes. I'm 10 foot up in the tree and it's able to reach up and sniff the bottom of my pant leg and my foot. Uh, 10 foot from the platform to the ground. Okay, so I'm aiming at this thing. And it's standing there looking up at me. And I notice it has, you know, the yellow colored eyes, the amberish colored eyes, like cat eyes, the, the cat, like a black cat colored eyes. And it looked like a giant coyote, like from nose to tail. And after a second, you know, I, my, my heart's pounding at this point because I'm thinking, what is this thing? This thing is huge and it's staring at me over the right, my right shoulder. And I'm already turned around and I'm basically kind of facing the tree a little bit, pointing the gun straight down at it. And it starts curling its lip back and growling. And it had a re- it was growling and snarling like a coyote growls and snarls. If anyone's ever heard that before, they'll know exactly what I'm talking about and how vocal they get and how nasty they can sound. But it was way deeper and way louder than any coyote I've ever heard. And it, I could feel the sound in my chest. It was so loud. And, and so deep. And as it, like, right after it starts doing that, starts circling my tree, probably only five feet away from the tree or so, maybe four, clockwise. Mind you, my, my, so my tree stands facing east. It was off my right shoulder, that's south. I'm standing up, I'm facing it. I'm pretty much facing the tree at this point, but aiming at that. And it starts circling my tree clockwise. And I'm making sure I have the sight on it the whole time. Like I'm literally doing tiny steps in a circle on this tiny platform way up in a tree. Pointing a somewhat cannon of a rifle at it. And... It goes around once and it gets, so if I was looking directly at the tree that's facing west, it gets past the tree and I I remember pulling the rifle in to my chest, pointing it straight back down towards the ground right at this thing, right at its head, off, off the other side of the tree. So that's like Northwest facing Northwest at this point. And I'm thinking I've had enough of this. This needs to stop. I put, and I'm thinking for a second, like it, as I, as this was happening, I was thinking, is this one of them dogmen? Should I shoot it? Would that be a bad idea? I'm thinking, well, maybe can I scare it off? Is this thing, if I shoot it, is this thing going to maim me or kill me? So 
So I decide after it goes around, I'm done with this, put one right, right in front of its nose, right into the ground. And it kind of jumps a little bit back. Just not, 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 not like, like, uh, probably like an inch or so, like, and is staring right at the ground, right where I had put this round and it dirt's falling down onto it. And I noticed it's pawing at its, its ears. Well, I have a fairly large muzzle brake on the end of this custom built AR and it, actually hurts my ear so much that i've actually went to clean my ear after shooting it with no hearing protection very bad idea wear your hearing protection always i've actually cleaned blood out of my ear after a day of shooting this rifle because it is so loud and deafening and it's falling at its ears and it's staring down at this little crater i put into the ground and stuff's falling on it and it shakes itself off a little bit slowly looks back up at me and as it does it starts walking away it looks away it's about 50 yards to my, my north so north of me it stands up and mind you there's that creek that I'm sitting next to it's the creek's 50 something yards away and it jumps across. I hear it hit branches and that was it. That's, that's all I could hear. And it was silent after that. And I finally come to my sense and I start looking around and I'm, I remember those two coyotes and I look back the, and I'm starting to look for them. And I notice they're still at that pine tree, 120 yards away. They're standing on their hind legs staring at me both of them and I'm thinking wow there's three of them and as I'm thinking that I see them both turn they look into the woods look back at me look back into the woods and jump and gone and that's since that day and I forced myself to go out the next day not not the next morning not when it was dark out I made myself come back out here and I sat out here. I walked out here again and I sat out here and there was, but there was birds chirping and I seen some turkeys and, and I remember I'm like, okay, well, that was weird. And, uh, I, I remember still feeling a little bit uneasy and nervous and, uh, you know, fairly hesitant to even go climb back up into that tree stand, you know, to get a look at the land. Sometimes I'll check, I check on my things regu- on a regular basis. Like every two to three days, I'll come drive out back and check cameras or check stands, make sure everything is clean, you know, taking care of stuff. So my grandfather doesn't have to. Now I, I, I still feel a little nervous every once in a while. And it's only been four or three weeks now since this has happened but even just getting halfway to the halfway point on the property to me is like at night is i find to be too stressful and it 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 has kept me up at night at times and uh my girlfriend is She's very hot blooded, so she has to sleep with the window open and it's been cooler lately. And sometimes if we don't have the fan going in our window and it, since it's been a lot colder, I find myself laying up at night listening and hoping that I don't hear any of these things again, or even see it looking in my window, which would be an ultimate terrifying experience. But maybe then I'll be able to prove to my girlfriend that these things are real and and uh, I, I have tried to tell a handful of people about it. And uh, I've told my grandfather. And uh, he thought I was, you know, he, he just told me, oh, you're seeing things. You know, you're seeing things. Probably staying up too way too late. Not getting enough sleep and you're seeing things. And no. <laughs> no, that's not the case. And I've told my grandmother. And she took it as I was just telling her some story. That somebody told me, like, 
oh, so is this some story? And I'm like, yeah, what's what's the point? And then I tried telling my girlfriend, and she just she's like, I don't think I don't know what you saw, but I don't think there's anything really out there. And it it, it sometimes it lately it hasn't been so bad to keep me up at night. I haven't had any dreams about it, which I I have had very bad dreams about it getting getting hold of me and you know i'd wake up in in a cold sweat at that point but you know as far as it being a fairly traumatic experience i really try not to let it ruin my day my life and the things that i enjoy and one of those things is being on this property and being out here and enjoying nature and in the way I like to enjoy nature. And I don't want that. I don't want that taken from me just because of some thing out here that, you know, it's gonna, you know, to me, it's like a wild animal, but you know, there's, it's almost like an ancient being that they know they, they think they're almost bipedal and almost, I wouldn't say humanoid like, you know, Bigfoot have are more humanoid like, but they kind of think the same way. Well, oh, if I mess with that, I'll get a good reaction out of that type situation. You know, it's almost like a game to them, and uh, it can be unsettling. But you know, I've what I've learned is to take it as it. It very much well could have easily ripped me out of that stand and tore me up, or even jumped up up in that tree with me and shredded me easily. Like there's no doubt that this thing could have easily hurt me. And even if I would have shot it, what I highly doubt, well, I don't highly doubt it. I don't doubt that it would wound it and make it fairly mad. But to me, that would probably, I'm kind of 50 50 on if i'll probably just make it mad and have it shred me or you know or have it just walk away with a bullet hole in it and leave me alone but i'm more on the side of i'm all like i said i'm almost 50 50 but i'm more of on the side of that i'll probably make it mad if i poke the right buttons and to me that seems like one of those buttons and uh i hope people take my experience as you know try not try your hardest it's some people it affects different and i understand that some people are affected differently and some experiences may be more traumatic and uh i try to li- basically i just take it as it comes like live each day as it comes type situation. And I try to block out any nerve or any nervousness I have about it. So that's my story. One day at a time. That's all you can do. We're going to call it quits for tonight's show right here, but we'll be back in a few days with part two. Thanks as always for listening and have a great night.